Curmudgeon 101. One of these days, it's going to start all different than anything you're possibly expecting. But when that day happens, we'll both be surprised. I just know it's in the works. Anyway, got a number of uh, uh, responses to the last one uh, to talk to you about again. And then uh, an interesting... Uh, discussion I saw on Facebook. So we'll get right to it. Um, okay. To quote, oh no, you got caught off in the middle of a story. I'm totally not paranoid enough to think it had anything to do with the Camp David White Mountain Boomer stories. Wink, wink. Yeah, well, <laughs> mistake happened. Um, sometimes I uh, start looking at them faster than they get downloaded and then I send it to the to Benjamin and uh, screwed up, but we got it corrected and he redirected and everything was fine. And it was just the last three minutes anyway. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this next one, it, it, it puzzles me too. In the Dragon, Volume 1, Number 1, June 1976. Yes, a month I remember well. On page 19, there's a little article called Creature Feature that states the boule, pronounced B-O-O-L-A-Y, has only two semi-vulnerable spots. The eyes are armor class 4, but very small compared to the overall bulk of the monster. The other is the undersize of the hinge portion of their back. And uh, cut off the quote. So I ask, why is there any question how the name is pronounced? <laughs> Your guess is as good as mine. This bullshit argument has been going on for years. I published it that way with a pronunciation because, believe it or not, we foresaw that people would wonder how to say it. Because when I floated it around the office. A couple of me said, okay, how's this pronounced? And uh, I said, we, okay, let's, let's show them. Now, I didn't know it at the time, but uh, it's pronounced that way because I say so, because I made it up. And if you want further justification, uh, it uh, is from my language, from my world, Makanda, with, so it's Macandron and it's Boule. Why do people argue? Well, there's people that think that they know more than you do about something that you created. That they know more about the taxonomy of something that you created and determined how. I don't know why these people are like this. Perhaps they have some deep-seated urge to feel superior to somebody else. And hey, if that's what floats your boat or scratches their itch, thinking, oh, Tim, you dumb shit, that's not how it's pronounced, fine, feel that way. Because when I lay my head down on the pillow each night, I think to myself, oh, you dumb shits, why didn't you just take what I gave you? Why do you think you had to be superior or different? I don't know. Stupid. Um, to your common sense rant, the idea of truth is objectively verifiable. Facts uh, is the idea of truth or objectively identifiable facts has been under attack by relativists and subjectivists for at least 20 years. The phrases your truth and my truth have become common and gum up people's brains. Agreed. It's like... Um, Alzheimer's for the ignorant, the uneducated, the unenlightened, the um, unexposed to anything but one narrow point of view. Um, 
I don't know what to say. I mean, I, I'll be honest. I was uh, raised in an extremely democratic environment when I was a young kid in uh, downstate Illinois. But hey, the first time I went and pulled levers for Republicans, I'm sure my grandpa Jim spun like a rotisserie on high in his grave. Uh, I, I learned to see that it's the man and not the party or the woman today. There were no women running then. Um, my truth, your truth. No, there's only the truth. I was a teacher. Um, there's only one truth. Two plus two is always going to be four. Drop that big rock on your foot over your foot, it's gonna fall and it's gonna hurt, always. That's the truth of gravity. Drop a brick on your toes, it will hurt. You will probably howl. You may suffer some broken bones. That's truth. I'd like to know how somebody else's truth could alter that. It is what it is. My truth, your truth. No, there is a truth, the truth. Usually between, somewhere between that quote, my truth and quote, your truth, there generally runs in between. Uh, okay, this is, I found to be an interesting, interesting statement. 5e is certainly the best version of advanced D&D. &D. But now that I've tried every edition, I know I prefer basic slash expert. Cool. Basic slash experts, a, a distillation of um, the same point in time from where I froze my game. Not quite advanced, certainly not original anymore. After all, look what I did to the original and all those supplements that I pushed, published, changed it, pushed it, pulled it, you know, like drawing out steel, heated it up and drew it out some more in a different direction. Um, but it's an interesting, it's, I respect the comment. You've tried them all. So in your opinion, 5e is the best. Having tried them all, your opinion has value, whoever you are. I may not agree with it, or I might agree with it. It has value. Saying that you something you've never played or never even looked at stinks. Again, you know, like I said last time, what difference is it? What good does it do to say, hey, it says in such an edition stinks? It's much good as me saying five card stud stinks just because I like hold them. Hmm. Uh, let's see what else we got here. Okay, back to bows. And I just watched a thing on YouTube about a bow. All right, as you recall, we were talking about the dwarf that wanted to fire a longbow. <laughs> and the various uh, it's interesting uh, obstacles he would encounter with doing to height challenges. A long bow is fired vertically, a crossbow is fired horizontally. They're usually around six foot because that was the appropriate size for usual archer who was a dude with big arms. Well, and actually now that they've dug up um, uh, graves from that period of time that yes, because the constant uh, practice required to be a skillful bowman, particularly a mercenary bowman, actually built up the drawing shoulder and the drawing arm uh, over time. Of course, remember that English law for a while said that every every free man would practice archery. At least I think they all practice like on Sunday or, you know, after church or whatever. I know there was a period of time in English history where every, every uh, free man was supposed to practice with his bow. Um, don't know how long it lasts, but the idea was interesting. Um, let's see. This is why I like original and basic more than advanced, because bows and arrows are pretty much the same, but built in different ways to generate more force suitable for the strength of the user. Yeah, okay. Um, I'm not, I, I didn't say, and I'm not saying now, that 
if you wanted to accommodate a dwarf who wanted to become be act as the artillery, the archer, fine. There's lots of ways you could do it. Um, I just watched a, a video with a bow made of the very rigid center stock and two much more flexible recurve pieces uh, fastened to the tops where that they did the actual energy storage. Certainly you could allow something like that, a clever copy of a bow scene from somewhere or in an old illustration out of a book, you know, or whatever. Um, the simple fact is, though, that a, that a long bow, a self bow, one piece, simply can't store enough energy to be used in dwarven size. It just can't. So here again, you got to rely on real physics. I know it's magic. You can give him a magic bow. That's a little bitty and tiny and shoots like a heavy crossbow. That's fine. It's magic. But if you don't want to clutter up your campaign with magical items, just neat stuff. So lots of ways that dwarf can become an archer and be believable. Otherwise, it's like buying one of those sets with the uh, braided string at the toy store that has the suction cups on the end. If they even sell those anymore, because God, I guess they don't. They're probably too dangerous. Amazing. One of those things when I was a kid, we got those and you put a uh, stronger string on it and you took the suction cups off and you sharpened the points in a pencil sharpener and we shot them at each other. Uh, of course, we wore, you know, shirts and pants and stuff, so they uh, rarely penetrated the skin. Occasionally scuffed it a bit. Um, okay. A comment on a non war game acquire my in-laws love acquire my mother and his mother in law is like a D, D fan with all of her acquire expanded rules i don't didn't know there were expanded rules for acquire i don't believe i even have a copy now but that's enough to make me want to go out and get one so as you know i don't give out names though the, the person that said that their in-laws have expanded rules Contact me again, and I would love to get a copy of them if they, you know, if a written out copy exists. Uh, good to hear about Ernie and Troll Lord Games moving ahead. I've been okay. I got two questions this week, and it took the hundredth numbered YouTube, actually, about the hundred and hundred and seventh or hundred and eighth video that I've done. And over a year on dragonsfoot.org using this word before someone finally asked what it means. It's the word I sign off with. Dodata Govi. Um, let's see. All right. So he wanted to know. He's glad to hear about Troll Load. We're all glad to hear about Ernie getting bailed out by the trolls. Um, and he wants to know about the word. Next one. Um, same, <laughs> same, same thoughts. What is Dada Govi? And thanks for the info about early in Troll Lords and the Memorial Tomb. Okay. Um, Dada Govi is Cherokee, and it is a goodbye to more than one person. I don't pretend to understand Cherokee. Um, this dates back to when I was a frequent poster on dragonsfoot.org. Um, there's a 120-some page locked but still viewable thread that I wrote over several years. And when I would go into chat with, um, you know, people like Ellie and, and uh, Asana and some of the others, uh, I would always sign off with, Dada Govi when I signed out of the chat room. And I look I, I looked for something unique. And it's taken all these years for somebody to finally ask. They were probably able to look it up because I was typing it then. But that's what it is. It's Cherokee. And uh Cherokee, however you pronounce it. And um 
That's what it means. Goodbye to more than one person. So it's like, bye, y'all. Except it sounds much more interesting. Um, all right. Another another comment on why we just feel compelled to argument. And it's another uh, psych psychiatric sociological uh, ex explanation. And it's, and it's entirely valid. I'm getting dry. I got to grease up. We have our four and a half year old great granddaughter here this weekend, and she hasn't gone to sleep yet. God, we have a whole day of stuff to do tomorrow. Um, let's see, where was I? Tribalism, yes. You belong to a group, I belong to a group. You shout at the other group because they're no good. And let's get mad at each other because you're not my group. It's tragically woven into our brains and our biology. With understandably childish results. Yeah, oh God, yes. Look at look at politics today. I'm just appalled by some of the stuff that so many people seem to believe. <clears throat> I am I, I'm will not make this political. Uh <laughs> my politics are becoming well known on my Facebook page with what I share. And my see my recent um uh, characterization of Mitch McConnell as the um, turd stuck in America's anus. Um, let's see. Okay, here we go again about the addition wars and tribalism. I mean, apparently I hit a card. I hit a chord. Um, all aspects of human existence. And I think it's in a major recent factor, or major factor in the recent comments by Martin Scorsese and why they struck so many nerves. You're right. If he doesn't like Marvel Comics, fine, but saying their crap is taking it far too far and essentially invalidating the views of the millions of people who do. Yeah, but let's stop there for a second. Um, I believe Mr. Scorsese was... Um, Making a distinction that's perhaps elitist, but I think is significant if you're a film fan uh, and not just somebody that goes to the movies for entertainment, there's a difference. Um, I go to movies that I call popcorn movies. Have fun. Wow, blow me away. And I go to movies that I refer to more as films because of the actors because of the the writing because of the subject matter whatever and i'm intently focused on that in a different way and i think that's what mr scorsese was trying to say that the marvel things that you see on the screen are movies but not films and i believe that the the great directors still working today probably share, and it might be, some of it might be sour grapes. Some of it might be envy. You know, look at these people putting up these simple formulaic, oh, finds out he has a head and power, oh, he goes through anguish, oh, some big realization, and now he's going to save the world. All they got to do is figure out how to do that with lots of great special effects. And it's entertainment. And there's nothing wrong with it being entertainment. I've enjoyed a couple, three of the Marvel movies. I love the two Ant-Man movies. Um, not because I'm a fan of any of the comics. I went there to be entertained. The only one I went to see that I was a fan of was the Doctor Strange movie. And I enjoyed it because I was, I was a, a longtime fan of Doctor Strange. But what Scorsese is saying is that the focus has shifted away from finely crafted films where the lighting and the camera angles and the blocking meant something. Today, it's fly around in a, in a, in a suit with lights all over it against the green backdrop and backdrop and they'll fill in the rest up there and man now you're 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 looking you know super heroic um there's nothing wrong with that 
but that's a lot easier to wow you than coming out of a film and saying, my God, that had a certain aspect to it. Creepy, foreboding, whatever. That's what that's from mood and lighting and blocking and angles and whatever. And I believe that's what Scorsese was saying, that uh, they're not the same and people shouldn't perhaps think of them the same. And he was lashing out about it. His point is valid. They are not what he makes. They are huge money makers. Frankly, I'm glad that I don't have a lot of you, too many more. Well, I, I hope to have a bunch, but it's not likely to watch movies go further uh, in that direction. Because I, I there's two or three coming out in the next three or four weeks that I intend to go see that will probably not be big blockbusters, will probably not knock everybody's socks off. But the people in them are the people that made them with the subject material, make them worthy to go, of go seeing. If the Academy Awards becomes nothing but a reflection of Disney's muscle, then all the uh, auteur-type directors will certainly have a reason to bitch and say that it's sold out to money as opposed to great storytelling. And I understand. I, I I like to tell stories, too, so I, I, I kind of understand. I, I like to think in a tiny way that I understand where he's coming from. Nobody cares about stories. They just want big, flashy shit all over the screen. Hey, I went and saw The Hobbit. I already knew the story, but I was all about those big, splashy battles all over the screen. You betcha. But, you know, was it extreme extremely great screenplay <laughs> hell no both of those arcs were way too long um okay yeah and he's essentially invalidating the, okay right okay common sense in rpgs at, at least seems to be something that develops with confidence and experience I played in games by people who've been running for years and games on the GM or DM is the first time and there's a much bigger difference that can be explained away through relative familiarity with the rules. There always be those who stick to the rules as written, but there but the more people run and play, the more likely they are to take logical liberties with what's in the book in favor of what makes sense. Great phrase. Logical liberties. You have to have a logical basis from which to, to expand your magic. And therefore, you have to take some logical liberties with the rules to make it fit your world. Because it really doesn't make any difference to anybody else but you and your players because your world is your world. Um. If there were a hundred other uninhabited uh, planets in, in the solar system that we knew about, I really don't give a damn on what's going on on any of them. As long as they're not uh, sending war armadas <laughs> coming out of the sky and, and obliterating our cities. I don't care what they're doing. Anyway. Let's see. Oh, uh, <laughs> this is one I didn't understand part of. Congratulations on being level 100. Now you get, now you can put Fafner in a lead, L-E-A-D, and put Odin in a half Nelson. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It, I, would, I would never, ever be a level 100 to anything because... <laughs> That that's that's uh, level creep uh, in level inflation, um, but I, I appreciate the humorous sentiment. Um, I look at and take let's take one of my favorite uh, solo or just with one or two other people pastimes, and that's pinball. And right over there, I have an excellent old electromechanical pinball machine, two-player, called Jumping Jack. 
Jumping Jack has five scoring wheels. That's all. 999,999 is the highest it goes up to. And if, and it takes like 61,000 to just get one replay. All right, so you're looking at a five ball machine. You're going to average 12,000 12, uh, or 12,000 rather a ball to get the, you know, or a little over to get the replay. Great game, tough to beat. All of a sudden, the new pinball machines coming out after this one had literally more bells and whistles, flashing lights, and more digits. Now, it wasn't okay for a target, a drop target, to be worth 10. It had to be worth 100. And then pretty soon it had to be worth a thousand in the next generation of machines. And when I say generation, it only takes about six years. Back then, it only took about six years for pinball machines to have a new generation. Um, do, you, do, do, do I feel that I need all the bells and whistles and flashing lights to have fun playing pinball? No. I got a machine right over there that I have a great deal of fun with. And my friends have fed. And I, I tell you, I have rolled the machine. That's when you have an incredible game and you roll it over and it starts back up from zero. And I have rolled the machine. I think I actually rolled it twice once. I think my high score is 227,000. I don't know. It's written on there. We have a, a sheet on the, on the machine of, all, of the best high scores. Dude, I need more bells and whistles and lights. No and complications and more balls. No, because I found something I liked. I don't ridicule you if you've got one of those in your basement with all the bells and whistles and everything. Though I might personally wonder, <laughs> I wonder how it keeps all that working because some more bells and whistles, the more things that get broke. Same thing might apply in rules. Too many rules, easier to break. I don't know, just something to think about. All right, here's a here's a cry from the wilderness. I wish I had found this sooner. I'm on episode 10. Look forward to coming home and watching until I get caught up. Well, I hope you're home from wherever you were. And boy, you got a lot of catching up to do. Because if it's only 10 there and now there's 100, that's 90. And they generally run about 30, 35, 30, 33 minutes on average. And then there's the ones before that. So that's 45 hours. Oh, man, you got a lot of listening to. Probably going to hate my voice. But, hey, thanks. I hope you make it through. Let me know what you think. Um, okay, I mean, this is the last one on the questions from the last issues. Then I have something from Facebook. I want to know more about polyhedral dice. You seem to have deep answers. <laughs> well, I, I asked Gary, you know, hey, why are we using these dice? Where would you find them? Okay, so I guess that's deep is tell us more about the early dice, how they used to be, about it, the early dice used by TSR, and do you have favorites that you acquired through the years? Well, all the dice we got, other than the first few handful of sets that were bought from, um, I don't remember if it was Edwards Educational or Supplies or whichever company it was. Might have been one of the math houses. But I think they came, a lot of them came from the same place, and that was Hong Kong. And um, the um, quality specs were nowhere near close enough to uh, be, a, be very accurate, except by accident. Um, I've told the stories. We had dice that always came up on the low sides. We had dice that always came up on the high sides. We had dice that were, dice that were kind of slaunched over in the mold. They didn't even look like 20-siders. They, 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 they rolled funny. Not a lot. No, don't, don't get me wrong. But keep in mind, we're buying tens of thousands of dice at a time. Um, old ones. I've got three old ones that I picked up over the years. 
Um, they have rounded corners and they're beat up and they're just in, they're not in my, they're not in my traveling bag. They're in my major bag, but the traveling bag that I take to cons and that's much smaller and they're all black and red and ominous. I do have some favorite dice though. Um, I used to have four and somebody stole one from me at a con. Um, they're 10 ciders. I have a green one, a black one, and a red one, and I had a white one, and somebody took it from me. I don't know what they came out of. They have their, their they have a unique shape. They're very rounded, but they, they never have a problem coming up with a reading. And I've shown them to every dice company in this country. Every, every con I go to, I show them to everybody selling dice. Nobody's ever seen any of them. Wish I could find some more of them. I've put pictures of them online. Um, I use them for initiative. I wish I had seven or eight more. So I've had seven or eight bad guys. I could roll in one for everybody, but I don't. Of course, that makes me clump them together and it probably works faster. But um, I've told the dice stories. Uh, uh, props to Luzaki. Luzaki set out to make precision dice. <laughs> now, this is the same Luzaki that made precision dice and then took plumber's crayons and filled in the numbers, thereby imbalancing the dice, I think, because he put more wax on one side than the other. Uh, the reason I say that is because at some point, uh, the Japanese Standards Association, they're like the underwriter's laboratory in the United States, I would, I guess. It's about the closest, except they have a government connection. Uh, put out a set of polyhedrons. I have it, three of them, that they guaranteed were accurate. They, was, they were as accurate as, as could be manufactured. And uh, some of the digits were inscribed deeper than some of the others so that all of the faces had the same amount of plastic removed or conversely the same plastic, amount of plastic remaining. Um, but Lou, Lou came out with the first dice that you could, you could rely on. And at the very beginning, they were brutal. Cause man, they had razor sharp corners. And they, they tore up your game mats and your game boards. You know, if you bounced them across a, a regular game board, they left little divots where the corners hit. But they were accurate. They were accurate. Um, now everybody takes pride in making accurate dice. Um, you no longer have to take 40 of them and throw them into a dishpan full of water and see how they float and start deciding what they, which are the good ones and which were not. Um, that's all I have for feedback from the last episode. But I do have, um, I ran across a very interesting thread. And it, it raises a couple of questions. In my mind, it raises a couple of questions. And it was, a, it was a, an interesting question. Um, how do you deal with slash why don't your slash players get addicted to potions? First question spring to mind is, God, how realistic do we have to be? They're magic. Um, but if you want to have, if you if you're going to play a nitty gritty, a campaign with all the gravel and the dust, it's not an invalid question. Now, personally, I always considered the minor stuff um, no more complex than what a skilled midwife or wise woman or herbalist of the Middle Ages. And I've always broadened their the ability to get ingredients, perhaps, but because different cultures in different parts of the world understood different plants and herbs and their healing properties in different ways. So 
I never worried about if, you know, the, the blood of the opium poppy got you addicted. You know, the sap of the opium poppy got you addicted. Not anything I ever, ever even, even considered. Now, I can see where if you play a really nitty gritty campaign, you could um, introduce that. However, it begs the question, why do we need to have, you know, fentanyl in our, in our role-playing games? We already have poisons that we make, you know, rather we make sort of mock of. Um, I don't treat clerics' spells and heals and stuff as spells. I don't call them spells. I treat them as prayers. In my world, and in the games that I run uh, at the cons, depending whether I'm using the high-level set of pregens or the low, still the same. When you make a, a level as a cleric, in my world, it's assumed that as you were getting there, you were assiduously studying to be ready for the next level, and you know all the prayers, incantations, invocations, not spells. Now, whether you want to burn some joss, light a candle to focus, whatever, that's, that's purely your bag. At the cons, I tell them, you have the capability, the, the juice, the physical, the mental fortitude to say, so many prayers of a certain potency in a 24-hour period. And I also say in, in con terms, that for instance, my low-level character, he's got two twos and two ones. And if he's burned both these ones and he's got a two slot left and he wants to say a one-level prayer, fine. He can't say two, but he can say one. And if he's burned both these twos and he's got one, two one slots unsaid, he can't combine them and make it a two. It's not the way it works. You're cheating your God. <laughs> I've had people argue me about that, and I said, that's my answer. Well, um, you're cheating your DNT. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody wants the blue bolt coming out and in and, and, uh, an inopp inopportune time. I guess you could put in that kind of stuff if you wanted. You could, I guess, I would be uncomfortable with it. I don't need it. Then again, I'm not running a day-to-day, -day, you know, week-to-week -week campaign in a big city or anything like that. Um, I used to get uncomfortable back in the 70s and the 80s when people talked about, you know, how they had their city set up and the drug smuggling and, the slavery and all that kind of stuff. And it's like, whoa, I don't need to go into those details. I've never described a slave market in any adventure that I've ever written. How gritty do you want your oatmeal? It's entirely up to you. I kind of like mine smooth. Uh, let's see, is there any other notes here? No, I guess that's it. Um, one of these days, I know I keep telling you that. Uh, let's see, I have no cons coming up. Thanksgiving's coming up. And I um, hope all of you have a uh, very pleasant holiday. And um, get your endorphin uh, fix. And if you're a football fan, watch football until your eyes glaze over. Um, I'm a soccer fan, so I'll probably uh, save something from earlier in the week. I don't know. I'll have to look at the schedule. Um, be safe. Be with your family, your loved ones, whether or not those are the same, I, I hope. And uh, on that note, I'll say uh, Dodada Govi. Oh, hello. I'm still figuring out the
these things first. <clears throat> Welcome to my cellar. He's the curmudgeon who wrote about the dungeons. Now he's the feller, live from the cellar. Talks about D and D and old school RPGs. Still quite a feller, the curmudgeon in the cellar. Last man around when the race went down. Calling Gary in that Lake Geneva town. Hey Gary, it's an awful mess. Let me edit, we'll have success. D and D and Dragon Magazine. He's a curmudgeon who wrote about the dungeons. Now he's the feller, live from the cellar. Talks about D and D and old school RPGs, but still quite the feller, curmudgeon in the cellar. Magic missile, it's a mortar shell. Make it hit in the first level spell. From psionics to the game, you attack that wizard brain. DSR and fantasy, collection of micro armory. Tight with tramp under a tree. Pie as could be. He's the curmudgeon who wrote about the dungeons. Now he's the feller, live from the cellar. Talks about D&D and old school RPGs, but he's still quite the feller, the curmudgeon in the cellar. Still quite the feller, the curmudgeon in the cellar. Curmudgeon.